Welcome back to the Mapscaping Podcast. My name is Daniel and this is a podcast for the geospatial community. This episode is all about making beautiful maps and I am not a cartographer, but my guest Mamatha Akella, Felt's cartographer, is. If you haven't already heard about Felt, it's well worth going back through the podcast archives and listening to an episode called Felt, Upload Anything. But again, today on the podcast, we're talking about making beautiful maps and this episode is geared towards cartographers. So in the episode, we start off talking about essential elements of map design, which of course starts with questions like, who is this for? What is this for? And how do I get it to them? And then moves on to visual hierarchy, zoom by styling, color palettes, and interpretation. During the episode, we discuss a few examples of Mammoth's previous work, and you'll find links to those maps in the show notes of this episode. Before we get started today, I want to mention that this that Felt helped make this episode possible. And when a, a company like Felt supports one episode, they end up supporting all of the episodes that I've published. So thank you very much, Felt. Thanks for supporting this podcast and the wider geospatial community. It's much appreciated. Hi, Mamatha. Welcome to the podcast. I, I think maybe the best way of introducing you is simply as Felt's cartographer. You do a lot of amazing design work at Felt. Felt has been on the podcast before. I'll put a link to that in the show notes of this episode. But today we're talking about how to design a beautiful map. And that's why you're here to help us understand how to do that. So welcome to the podcast. Um, perhaps you could take a second to just tell us a little bit about your journey. If you could crush your journey into a tweet, how did you become a professional cartographer? How did you become a cartographer at, at Felt? Thank you for having me. And I, in a tweet, my journey to become a cartographer would be by accident, but love it. And I've created a career out of um, building cartographic thinking into products used by many people so they can make maps. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Okay, <laughs> now, now you've got the option of expanding this into a tweet thread and, and give us, are there four or five companies that people might have heard of that you, you've worked for before? Yeah, so I started my career out at um, a very well-known mapping company called Esri, and I was a cartographic product engineer there working on their first generation of online base map. And then I moved on to the National Park Service, and there I did the first generation of their online cartography, including the first National Park Service online base map. And I then moved over to Cardo, where I was the head of cartography for about five years. And I that's at a point in my career when I kind of moved over from more of the base map cartography to doing thematic cartography on the web. And I've also done a stint at Damon Design, working on client projects, specifically on the Facebook base map with a team of other Stamen cartographers. And now I work at Felt and I've been here for about two and a half years and work on everything cartography here at the company. Well, you've convinced me. You sound like <laughs> someone who's worth listening to for the next 45 minutes of my life. <laughs> I appreciate it. And this is, of course, the, the goal for the audience as well, like help them understand a little bit about the, the context that, that, you're, that you're, where, where your insights come from, why you say these kind of things, and hopefully sort of build up a bit of that, that feeling that, that you're, oh, this person is talking, Mammoth is talking, I, I should listen in. The hope <laughs> of, of this episode is to, to help people understand how to design a, a beautiful map. I know you have some, some great insights in this, but I, I want to start... I just want to give the, the audience sort of a very brief overview of the kinds of things that I was thinking about. So I was thinking about when I think about a, a beautiful map, I think about a, you know, a compelling story. I think about, you know, what are we doing? How are we, try, how are we doing it? This is something I've stolen from you. It's visual hierarchy. Hierarchy. <laughs> I know nothing about that. I'm going to need help with that later on. Combining layers. So this should be obvious to most GIS people. The idea where you have a base map and then you put thematic layers on top of that and, and use this to, to help create context for, for the viewers. And then I want to talk a little bit about styling data and maybe towards the end go off into some, some tips and, and tricks. How does that sound as a, as a broad overview? Sounds great. Great. Okay. A compelling story. <laughs> what, what, why, why do we need a compelling story? Why is this a good starting point for a map? In the map making process, the ultimate goal is to create a good map. And a good, a good map is almost like a narrative that 
clearly communicates its message to the reader. So if you're thinking about how do you take this raw data that you found or an idea for a map and literally transform it into an informative story or a conversation piece, that's really what we're kind of talking about when thinking about what is a compelling map story. So, you know, some of the things that all cartographers and most people that make maps think about is your map's message. What is your map about? Who is going to be the map reader? Um, do they know the topic well, or are they technical or are they not technical? The, the way that your map's gonna be delivered, is it going to be delivered online? Is it a printed map? Um, these are kind of some of the decisions or things that you have to think about before you go into the map making journey itself, because you need to understand some of the uh, prerequisites for how your map is going to be viewed by who, et cetera, before you start actually planning on making your map. And I think there is also a lot of things that make a map more compelling. So, okay, you've found your interesting data, you know your audience, you really know the story that you want to tell, and you've been making your map. And so some of the things if you're going to publish your map to think about is how do you how do you make it engaging? So those are things like have a large title clearly explaining what the purpose of your map is. Have information on there. A lot of times when you're looking at attributes and data, you're simply looking at summary statistics almost. But a lot of times when you're making a map too, you're on the internet, you're reading, you're researching, you're trying to understand the topic well. And so it's also to make a compelling map story is to also provide that other contextual information about the raw data, again, to transform it into something that can be easily understood by the end user. In order for your map to be engaging, it almost also has to be aesthetically pleasing. Um, you know, a lot of times people will engage with your map more if they see it and it's clear and, okay, I know this map is about this topic and wow, I can really clearly see that because you want the map reader to be able to identify their own patterns in the map. There's many other things, but I think those are some of the, the key, the key things, your maps message, who the end user is, how it's going to be published and just the different techniques that you can use to make it a compelling map story and to really keep it uh, cohesive and coherent and not go off in too many different directions. So th this is not exactly the same, but when I think about cre creating a podcast episode like this, I, I think about those things too. What is a compelling story? What should the title be? Who is this for? And, and what is it for? And then once I've figured out who it is for and what it is for, so this episode, for example, is about how to design a beautiful map. It's for people that want to design a beautiful map. What is it for? It's to help them figure out how to do that. It's to highlight some of these points that are important when, when designing maps. And then the rest of it is like, well, how do I tell people that. So I've got this idea in my head, how do I make it so when they see the episode, when they see the map, they know it's for them. And then you talked about publishing as well. Where is it going to be published? Where is your map going to be published? Um, I think about that too. How are people going to find it? Because if I know who it's for, I know what it's for, and I make it for those people, then they need to find it somehow. So it's not exactly yeah. the same, but I, I think about a lot of these things. And with that in mind, so before this episode, before we push the record button, we found a couple of maps that we could talk through. And I want to talk about this one here for a second. It's the Appalachian Trail Planner. Now, to, to my untrained eye, it's not, it's not the most beautiful map in the world, but I thought it was a good example of a compelling map because it's it. It's clear who it's for. It's an Appalachian Trail Planner. It's pretty hard to misunderstand that map, I think. Yes. Yeah, it has a clear title and a clear kind of action. Um, it's pretty much a checklist for the things that need to happen um, in order to go on this Appalachian Trail hike. The Appalachian Trail is clearly highlighted on the map with a start to end. And you can see that along the way, there's different points of interest. The, the author of this map hasn't added too much additional information to take away from the core message of the map and they've used the words too that people are you know that obviously that the things people are interested in the words they use the trailhead 
the campground trail, park boundaries, and they haven't over-cluttered the map. I guess what I'm saying is that the message is really, really clear for me. Uh, just out of curiosity, do you know where the, all of this, where, where this data came from? Yeah, so this map in particular is built up completely of felt data library layers. So we have a collection of many different layers across different themes. So this is in the nature. So we have uh, National Park Service boundaries. Um, we have U.S. Forest Service boundaries. And then within each one of these park boundaries, we have trails, campsites, et cetera. And these are all pre-styled and ready to be used on your map. So in addition to being completely made up of data library layers. This map also uses all the default symbology that the data library layers are styled with. And then on top of the data, the base map, the data layers, they've used elements and the start and the end text, um, all of the pins along the way. And even if you zoom into certain places, you can see some YouTube videos and other interesting uh, links throughout the map. Could I animate this map? Like with the start and the end, it would be kind of interesting to to play this out, right? So you know, I can see the different breaks they put in day one, day two, day three kind of thing. C can I do that on in, in Felt? Currently, n no, you couldn't do an animation, but what we could do is, you know, if you had your hike planned out from day one to seven and you had that as data, you could symbolize it categorically and kind of filter through the days via the legend. But in terms of like animating it, not at this time. I, I think you should work on that. That would be pretty amazing. Yeah, agree. <laughs> <laughs> not, not that I need to tell you how to do your job or anything like that. Um, we, we, we digress a little bit because again, <laughs> we talked about who is it for, what it's for. It's about designing beautiful maps, compelling stories. And that's where we started. Visual hierarchy. So this is something I've, I've stolen from you. I, I have no idea what this means. Maybe you could help me out. Yeah. So I think at a very uh, basic level, visual hierarchy is the visual separation of your map um, into layers of information. So this is one of the core guiding principles in cartography. And similar to what we were talking about previously with a compelling story, we have data, right? And it is our it's our job to organize that information so we can help our map readers focus on what is most important. So when you're talking about visual hierarchy, there are certain concepts, you know, we don't have to get too deep into the weeds on it, but really what's important is to think that every map has a, a background and a foreground. So if we're looking at the Appalachian Trail map, Daniel, what would you say is the background? Ooh, putting me on the spot, I'd say the <laughs> the the base map. Uh, so I don't record video for this podcast, but the base map is is, is pretty light. It doesn't. It's not overwhelming in any way, shape, or form. It's yeah. It, it looks very much like a canvas, if that makes sense. It looks like yeah. It's designed to highlight whatever comes on top of it. It gives context, but it's not overwhelming. Exactly, and so that is in the background. 100% you're right. And it's just providing some um, geographic context. And what's in the foreground is the Appalachian Trail and the hike and all of the stops along the way. So some of the different techniques that cartographers use to promote this bigger ground visual hierarchy are things like font size. Here we can see the start and the end are really large because those are important pieces of this, this visual representation of this hike. We also use color, so you can see that this map uses more saturated, vibrant colors for the information that they want the user to see right away versus the background colors of the base map. And the way that the data layers have been designed is they've kind of been designed to sit in the background as well to provide additional, additional context. So it's really visual hierarchy is really like what are the um, design techniques that we use to guide the viewer's attention to the important pieces of the map do you think it's fair to say that the, this a lot of this is done for me just because i'm using a base map and thematic layers yes yes i would say that because in felt specifically and in a lot of 
base maps, online base maps, you will definitely see that they are more muted, pushed to the background. And because the base map is, it kind of shows you the landscape, right? It shows you boundaries, it shows you cities, it shows you states, it shows you where features are in the world. And so in these kind of online mapping tools, it is very common that you need this contextual background, but that most likely what's gonna happen is that there's going to be overlays. And in the felt context, that overlay could be a data layer or it could be elements. And so, yes, I definitely agree with you that that is a that's a that's a really important relationship in the online mapping context. Could you just briefly explain the difference to me uh, between data layers and, and elements? Like I, I have an understanding of what this means in, in other software, but it's not clear to me how these two like what, what the separation is here in, in Felt. Yeah. So in Felt, what we would call a data layer is anything you upload that is spatial. So it's you know your any data shapefile, GeoJSON, whatever it may be, raster layer, that's what we consider a data layer. We also have data library layers, which we've talked about a little bit. And those are data sets that are out there from OpenStreetMap, from US Census Bureau, from a lot of different organizations for commonly used data sets to help construct a map. And so those are also data because we've uploaded them ourselves and, and styled them and provide them to the user. When I'm talking about elements, I'm talking about all of the annotation and drawing tools. So in felt, an element could be a pin, that's a location. Um, an element could be a marker drawing. An element could be any of using any of the routing tools. So in felt, actually the elements are highest in the visual um, hierarchy. If you were just using felt and not adding your own data, let's say if you're using our base map, our data library layers, and adding annotations and additional information with elements, um, the elements typically do come to the foreground. And that's because that's how you can kind of add more um, context to your compelling story. Um, just out of curiosity, so so I'm, I just want to clarify, I'm not the power user of felt that you are. Can I, are those elements, are they just visual? Can I do any, I, I guess in QGIS world, we'll call it geoprocessing on them? Yeah. So, uh, okay, cool. So I could, I could buffer these particular points if I wanted to, I could, you know, to, to make them stand out. Yeah. So you could, um, any element can be converted to a data layer right inside of felt. So say you had these five points along the Appalachian Trail that you that you added to the map with the pin tool, everything in felt is data. So even though it's an element, it can, uh, it has a spatial location of where you've placed it. And so when you convert that to a layer, um, it holds that information in addition to maybe any other details you've added. And then you can start doing geoprocessing. You can style with the layer styling tool. So if you had, if you want to make a proportional symbol map or anything like that, and that is across the board today for fun, I drew a heart and with the marker tool and I converted that to data and I buffered it just for fun like three different times. And then I use the data layer styling tools to style it. So yeah, it's definitely possible. And it's really one of the really unique pieces of felt. You can also go the other way where if say you wanted, say the Appalachian Trail was broken up by which state it was in and you only wanted the portion that went through Pennsylvania, you can, you can click on a portion of the trail and you can make that an element to bring it to the foreground and to do different element things with it. So it's really neat, this kind of uh, relationship between data and element world and how they work together. And, you know, if you don't have data, you can create it. I, I didn't realize you could do that. You could click on data and, and you know, make it into an element. It makes a lot of sense. If elements can become data, then why can't data become elements? I, I just didn't realize that was possible. Um, yeah. Can I uh, point you at a, another compelling map? So we've talked a bit about this previously, you know, but again, before we push record, it's the global shipping, uh, the, the title is global shipping traffic. And <laughs> in some ways it breaks a lot of the rules that I was taught at university. So, you know, there, there's no North Arrow on it. There, there's no legend that, that I can see. Maybe I've clicked the wrong button. But it's compelling because 
it, it's it's beautiful. Like it's it's absolutely beautiful. The colors are Thank very vibrant, you. and it's just it's almost like mapping the world, the the uh, you know the land um, using these uh, global shipping traffic. It's it's fantastic. Um, but this to me is a very it's a compelling for a very for a lot of very different reasons. It's compelling because of the colors. It's it's not clear to me exactly what it's for, but I think it's compelling anyway. Could, could you talk to me a little bit about this map, please? How, how did you make it, firstly? What data is involved? So I found some really neat data from the World Bank, and they had done a collaborative project with IMF. And there's a whole methodology behind how they collected these data, but what they put out are different raster data sets of different types of shipping traffic. So I brought the data into felt and I at first didn't really, I, you know, I think it happens a lot. It's like, you don't know what to expect. You drag and drop a file or you open a file and name your tool and you don't really know what is going to be there or what to expect. So after a little bit of fussing around, the first one that I actually looked at was the commercial commercial shipping density. So if I just like hid the visibility of the other layers, you can just really start to see some very interesting patterns about where commercial shipping happens. And given that this was raster data, it kind of came in and I had to just take some time trying to understand the data better and exclude some values or else the whole map was one color and mess around with the color palettes a little bit. So I used, you know, in felt for category maps, numeric maps, raster, raster maps, we have a set of color palettes for each, um, many of them by me. So I kind of know my way around, like we were talking about an expert here, but I just started with some of the default palettes that were in there and now with raster styling, you can easily adjust colors, adjust the histogram to really pull out these brighter areas where there's a lot of shipping happening. The biggest thing with this, especially since I was symbolizing all four of these types and for our listeners, it's uh, commercial, leisure, fishing, oil, and gas. I had to really mess around with the color palettes and the histogram because I didn't want to blow out the map, I really wanted to highlight the high traffic areas mostly from each. And then the other ones that are coming through are, yeah, just commonly traveled and, and really used a lot. Uh, if, if anybody made a copy of this map and was playing around with the histogram and the colors on their own, you will see a lot more of these less traveled patterns emerge, which is also very interesting, especially if you're looking at something like fishing, where is illegal fishing happening, that kind of stuff. But since this was showing so many different types of shipping traffic, kind of had to make some decisions on where to emphasize and where to de-emphasize. And that was done through color and adjusting the histogram values. It almost looks like you've chosen a start and an end color for, for some of these categories. Uh, am I right? So yeah, in felt, what you can do is you can start with one of our color palettes or you can create your own. And if you want to do a custom one, so for example, if I wanted to go from a dark blue to a light blue or a dark blue to a white, all I need to do is define that start dark blue and the end white. And then what felt will do will interpolate the colors along the rest of my values and do it in a perceptual color space. So it's really nice because color palettes are notoriously hard to to make and then to have them be perceptually uniform and in the right color space is a whole other obstacle that map makers do face. So we've tried to simplify that process by doing some of the smart calculating in the background so you don't have to worry about it. Does that mean I can take any sort of value I want for my start and my end? Or do, could I just take a start? I, I like this color. I want to this color start here and end up somewhere else. Would, would that still work? Yeah, you could. I you need a you need a start and an end, but I think actually you can have a start and you can keep adding a color and that will, I'm just trying to think in my head if it will vary. I think it's best practice to have a start and an end. And then if you want 
any colors in between, you can press the add color button. And that what that does is it finds the next color in between that start and end that you've defined. Okay, so th that makes sense. I'll have to try that out. Uh, one of the things that makes this map for me compelling, make, makes it beautiful is like your choice of colors for a start. It's, it looks like there's a lot going on, but there's no land. You know, like yeah. it's the, the data highlights the land, if that makes any sense. It's amazing. Yeah. What beautiful data can do to create maps. Yeah, it's 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 amazing. It's stunning. How did you know not to, was this a trial and error thing? Or how did you know not to put uh, put land there? Because you, you know, most people want to see the land. It helps us like, oh, OK, yeah, it, it gives yeah. us so much more context. I definitely did start with having the countries in there. But then once I had those in there, it almost felt like, oh, wait, but the, the shipping routes are really shaping the land naturally. And actually putting the countries in there was even if they were really pushed back. So even if they were in the background and our shipping, global shipping traffic's in the foreground, like just adding the countries changed the aesthetic of the whole map. I don't know. It's just something about how the, these data themselves just help you see all the connections in the ocean but that also composes the land yeah it's it, uh, honestly it's fascinating I'll, I'll have to put a link to this in, in the show notes if you had to choose a color for land what how what color would you choose and, and i guess what i'm asking is how would you know what colors or, or what color is going to work nicely with those those four or five really vibrant colors that you've chosen so this map doesn't have a base map right it's just really a canvas so another thing you can do in felt is set the background color of your map. And so I went with almost black here. And if I was to put countries in, um, the one thing that I tried is if let's say that the background of the map that I chose is a really dark gray. One thing I did try is like having black countries. So they're not like really in your face or anything. They're they're still pushed back to the background and the context, but then they kind of highlighted the, the global shipping traffic on land a little bit more because there's not as much of it. So the so having black there would give that contrast for those brighter colors. But I would definitely do something that was pretty close to the background. It's it's interesting. My my next point to talk about was this idea of com combining layers with with base maps, and part of the reason why I thought this was a compelling example to talk about the lack of the base map because it works because the the data itself, the binary between where the data isn't and where the data is, actually cr gives you that that context. Totally, yeah. And I'm classic. I I actually I don't use the traditional base map a lot because. I like to just construct the map um, and only put the information on there that I think that it needs. And sometimes for me, base map seems like too much information. I talked to another cartographer, John Nielsen. This was a long time ago. He, he works for Esri. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, of course, you know, John. Um, <laughs> and I was asking him, how do you know what to leave out? Like, you know, how, because it's not about, at least in my mind, it's not about how much can I put on here. It's almost more about like, what what is the minimum I need to, to tell the story? Yes. Yeah. And I think that goes across a lot of, like I did have the global ports on here and all of a sudden, if those come on, it becomes like a completely different map and you can see the patterns, but even though they're very small and yellow points, you can see the patterns, but somehow you can't see them very well anymore you know maybe it would be better of like what are the what are the global ports that are the busiest and just putting those on there but it's something about even a small decision like that just really changes the entire visual aesthetic of a map like this yeah i i completely agree there's something about the simplicity of, of this map here that the way it is now that 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 that's really striking, I think. Um, I just want to mention for the listeners that when you're saying, I'll just put this on, you just do that. We're both looking at the same map and then I can see the changes live. It's, it's, actually, it's yeah, really cool. It's so cool. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about you know, c combining these layers and, and maybe styling them as well. One of the things I imagine that is really, really difficult as a cartographer, you're working at making online, you know, online maps, doing on digital cartography, is Zoom-based styling. Um, do you have any sort of, I don't, I don't know if you can offer any tips for people there, like how do you know, or is it just trial and error? 
depending on if you look at online maps, Google Maps, Apple Maps, any map that you may use for navigation, you're actually looking at uh, Zoom-based styling all the time, right? So when you're zoomed out at a state level versus when you're zoomed into your local city block, the, the information density is much different. You know, when we're talking about compelling story and visual hierarchy, um, a, another method to use for both of those, both a compelling story and to promote figure ground and good visual hierarchy is to introduce information thoughtfully through Zoom. So, you know, if you think about, oh, I have a 100 million points on a map, you could put those all on the map. Yes, there's nothing wrong with that, but your compelling story kind of goes out the window if you haven't thought about different ways to group that information or introduce it through Zoom. You can make a map of the city and have all of the city amenities on there, but maybe you want to bring some of the information on at a later Zoom. You want to gradually fade some of the information in. Um, you actually want something that was a point representing a park when you zoom in to then uh, transition into the actual area polygon of the park. So there's a lot of different techniques when zoom-based styling is really helpful. And especially like you were saying in this digital online cartography, it's, it's one of our, the most powerful tools that we actually have to introduce information thoughtfully as users zoom in and out to provide a clear and cohesive picture that is our map. And I think this is easier said than done. So I'm looking for an example of, it's a map called DC Points of Interest. When you open the map, it just says Washington, and it's got the, the, the boundary, the city boundary of Washington, and that's it on, on a base map. That's it. I zoom slowly in. Washington doesn't, the interesting here is Washington as a title right in the middle of the boundary doesn't disappear. It just becomes more washed out and then as I get really close, disappears. And it's interesting that you've chosen, or whoever made this map has chosen to have uh, Washington itself slowly disappear, but the other data sources, they come on quite fast, like they are uh, on or off, yeah. if yeah. that makes sense. Definitely, so yes, I made this map, and this was a map kind of demonstrating some of these Zoom-based styling capabilities. So I wanted to kind of show the gamut of them. So when you're looking at Washington, what's happening there is I'm transitioning opacity through Zoom. So, you know, when you're zoomed out, it's at full. And then as you zoom in, the opacity fades down to zero. And so similar to what we we're talking about with, with colors, what you can do there is say, I want this opacity at one zoom and I want this opacity at another zoom. And then we interpolate the in-between opacity values for you. So it's not like you've had to say 10 different opacity values. You can do that. That is also possible, but it's really nice to kind of just be able to say, I want to see the label completely at this zoom. And then I want it to fade out and not have that harsh, uh, disappearance or introduction, like you're saying with the other labels. Or have to create all those rules yourself around every single possible Zoom level. Yeah, you know, traditionally, if you're right, if you're handwriting a style, let's say in something using the Maplibre renderer, that is actually the renderer that we're using behind the scenes. So you can do this start and interpolation across all of the different properties. But there are times where you do want to add in more stops. So if I only have defined two zoom levels in, in this for my opacity, there could be cases where I actually don't want it to fade out as quickly as it is. And I know at my middle zoom, I still want it to be 50%. So there's different cases where you would add in more zoom stops for whatever property it may be that you are doing zoom-based styling. on. Now, I, I can see from the legend that you're using Overture Places, so Overture Places data. And it looks to me that you've made some decision or some decisions happening around what places are shown at what zoom, like in, in terms of the labeling anyway. So the points are visible and then the labels, I don't know if there's a conflict detection going on here, but there's something interesting going on with the labels. What, what's happening there? Okay, so you go from Washington to seeing the neighborhoods and then overture places, 
get introduced. So when you're looking at it before the labels come on, this is kind of giving you a sense of the pattern and the distribution of these POIs around the city. I mean, in this map, it's not really important for every single one of these POIs to have their label yet because it could actually be really too overwhelming, right? But, you know, we are online, so there's other things you can do, like click on a point if you're interested in knowing what that place is before, before it comes on. So, yeah, so now we can like really see, okay, in this Chinatown area, there is or in this Lo Logan Circle Shaw area, there's like a lot of landmarks and historic historic features. So then when you zoom in a little bit more, what happens is the uh, buildings kind of fade in. So now each POI is more connected to a building. And then also you have the road labels transitioning in. And so what this has done is it's gone from very, very general map to kind of understanding a pattern across the city to zooming in and seeing all of the details, even maybe how to get there and what the name of the place is and what other POIs are, are around the one that you're interested in. That makes a, a ton, a ton of sense. Uh, again, I want to mention this overture of places data. Is this like, a, it sounds like a map that you've made. What was the process like getting this data into, into felt? Yeah, so my um, colleague, Mike Magurski, he he extracted it for me for about five or six cities because it had just come out and I wanted to take a look at it. So he, he downloaded the files for me and I just uh, drag and drop them into <laughs> felt. Um, I did realize that there's a lot of categories in there. So I went into QGIS and I did a feature count to get, I don't know, like 10, the top 10 categories or whatever it may be. And using the QGIS to felt plugin just imported that queried layer into here. Cool. I, I want to talk a little bit more about felt and, and desktop later on, but I, I think we'll just leave that for a bit for the time being. Uh, raster styling. So we talked about, you know, some of the things to think about when you're styling thematic layers, vector data. What about raster styling? And the example that I have here that I think is, is interesting for a lot of different reasons is a layer that you have called E Topo Global Relief Model. Can you tell me a little bit about this layer, please? So E Topo is a lot of people know about it who are cartographers and beyond. It's a global relief model, and it's basically you download it as a DEM digital elevation model. Um, that's a raster, and so you know rasters are pixels of with rows and columns and every pixel has a value in it. So when I first brought this into felt, it's just this, um, I mean, you can, you can see the topography and you can see the bathymetry through the black and white representation of the raw DEM. Um, but really to bring this to life, I did a couple of different things. First of all, I, I made a hill shade inside of felt and with raster styling, that's, I think making a hill shade in felt is the easiest hill shade I've made. There's, you know, you just bring in a DEM or any raster, and then you choose the style by option to hill shade. And then all of a sudden you have a hill shade. You can adjust things like the azimuth and the angle and things like that and the intensity of the hill shade. But that was step one. Just before we go on, why why make a hill shade? What is it about hill shades? Hill shade really um, brings out the topography. So if I had just had this be the DEM that I got and I applied the coloring to it, you you would see the bathymetry, the ocean depths, and you would see the uh, terrain, you know, but through color, and it wouldn't actually give you that terrain representation where it's basically drawing based on the pixel values, the shape of the elevation. So that's why you see like the Himalayas popping out, the Rocky Mountains, things like that. If we didn't do hill shade, then it would just kind of be flat. I, I realize it was a bit of a naive question, but I wanted to hear your your interpretation of it. Like I, I don't know too much about this particular data set, but was it easy to figure out where the ocean and the you know where the ocean stops and the land starts so basically the land and water separation you have the zero point and so anything 
negative from zero are the different ocean depths and then anything positive from zero are are the land but what was really the most important part about this is making sure that i was defining enough elevation values on either side to get the detail because if i didn't have enough elevation values either in the ocean or the land there were a lot of places where it was just blending together and by using this like kind of hypsometric tint on this hill shade that is really how i could do it so i think i have i'm just looking but i think there might be like a um i don't know a hundred something steps that i have in here and I've applied the, the dark blue to white color ramp to the ocean values and then, and then the land colors to the land values. Did you consider changing colors for lakes? Um, that one was really hard because, you know, some lakes actually are negative. Ah, of course. Okay. Yeah. So that was really complicated. The reason why I wanted to talk to you about this particular data layer was because at the start it looks like oh it's it's a DM. Um, just stretch the color values, you know, and uh, apply a stretch in, in some way, shape, or form to it. Pick some values that kind of look like land, you know, green to a, a lighter shade of green, maybe brown kind of thing, and then the oceans are blue. Yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> but and uh, I've tried doing similar work to this in the past, and it's not actually as easy as, as a lot of people think. No, it's really not. This this was a labor of love. A, a lot of work has gone into it, that's for sure, because I, I keep looking around for, for edge cases, like, oh, I bet you it was really difficult to classify that area there, and like everything I've looked at <laughs> so far, it looks like you've done you've done a brilliant job, and the depth that you've managed to bring out in it is, is really quite impressive, especially in the ocean, I think. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is available in our data library. And the other thing that anybody can do with any of these data library layers is restyle them. So I encourage people to add them in. If, if there's something that you wanna change about the style or if it doesn't go with the aesthetic of, of your map, you always have the option to change. Our, these are just all suggestions and places for people to get started. With this map, with this with this DEM data, did you have to do, was there any sort of processing, pre-processing of it before you started working on it? Yeah, so um, I work with a lot of awesome people that um, know how to do great stuff. So, you know, Mike giving me the Overture POI data, um, my colleague Damon, he made this, this comes in tiles and he got it together and stitched them together for me so I could bring it into felt like as it is here. But other than that, we didn't do any other processing other than data preparation. Okay, I want to get back to this idea of, of how we make beautiful maps. And it sounded to me like what one of the things you, you knew about this data is, oh, people have worked on this data before, and oftentimes it looks like this. And that, was, that gave you kind of a blueprint. Oh, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to use the, 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 this known path to style this data in, in this way so people can easily recognize it. And I think this is a helpful thing to do. Yes. Um, do, you, do you think about this with symbols as well, like using easily understandable symbols like oh so hikers are used to seeing this let's have something that that reminds them or that it's easy for them to to, to recognize and, and understand yeah definitely as much as we can i think it's important to use blue for water and you know green for parks some of the more associative things that people are very familiar with in every map you don't need to reintroduce common things why not just stick to things that people know well, and that definitely does go with symbols as well. And I learned that a lot through my work at the National Park Service and the amount of work that has gone in into creating the symbol standard that they use on their maps um, that are universally understood and require don't require a big legend and don't get people confused. Uh, I definitely recommend using symbols and colors that are known and don't need to have an additional step of imp interpretation on your map um, in order to use it when possible. I think this gets back to the idea of like, who is it for? What is it for? And if those people that you're making this for already understand that, then, then why not just make it a little bit easier for them and remove that that extra step from the de decision trees? Oh, okay. It, it, for me, it's, it's helping people understand 
what it is that you, that, that you're doing, help yes. them get the message. Definitely, definitely. So I, I think we've covered a lot of ground in the conversation, and I really appreciate you slowly but surely w- walking me through a, a lot of this stuff. It's important for the listeners to know that there will be a bunch of links in the show notes so you can go and have a look at these particular maps that we've been talking about. Uh, but just as we sort of draw to the end of our conversation and time together, I, I'd be really interesting to hear if there's any tools that you keep coming back to, if you have to do something outside of felt, what, what are the tools are you using to, to do your processing, to do your analysis? So I am a big user of QGIS, and I would say that is the number one tool that I use on a daily basis. I also used to work at Cardo, so I know that tool very well, and it's also a tool in my toolbox when I need to look at different aspects of data. And, you know, I use Google Sheets a lot for just cleaning up data, and believe it or not, I also I use VS Code for for my work um, in different areas, but I also use it a lot for data stuff as well. For example, if I have like 200 categories and I need to format the data to bring it into felt um, and get all the attributes and the colors matched up and everything. So I kind of have a different arsenal depending on the task, but I'd say primarily QGIS. QGIS, very, very popular open source desktop GIS. Is Felt here to replace desktop GIS? Is that, is that the goal of Felt? No, Felt is really meant to be used as um, a companion tool. And I think, you know, with QGIS, a lot of what happens is your maps kind of get locked in to the tool. Collaboration becomes really complicated. If you and I are working on a map together, how can I quickly and easily share it with you and get your feedback and kind of start that teamwork that we need to do together. So definitely not a replacement, just a compliment and a way to unlock a lot of the fascinating work being done in QGIS and sharing it, whether it's with your uh, team, the world, whatever it may be, felt just enables that workflow. This is a great way of tying it back to exactly what we're talking about at the start. So who is it for? What is it for? How how can we make sure they understand the messaging, the people that we're making this this map for? How how do we make sure this is as clear as it can possibly be so they get that it's for them? And then the other thing is helping them find it. And for me, this is you know publishing data and being thoughtful about where I publish it and how I publish it, like putting it in people's way. And I guess this is kind of what you're saying with QGIS. It's hard to, you know, if we're making something for people, we want to get it out to them, we need to be able to share it. And for me anyway, this is where I see the like the, the magic of that relationship between QGIS and, and Felt. Yeah, same here. And it's really nice, like just in your workflow, um, as I was talking about with the Overture, POIs, um, being able to do something in there and then connect that directly back to felt. And then, you know, if I had a team with a workspace, being able to put that data in there um, in a more collaborative environment, there's so many different connections that are so beneficial between the two tools. It was actually pretty cool to see you just changing layers and playing around with the, the histograms live and seeing the effects on my side. I, I hadn't experienced that before. <laughs> that, that was pretty cool. Yeah. Hey, um, like right at the start, we mentioned this, this sort of long, illustrious career that you, you've had. <laughs> and I'm sure you'll continue to have. There'll be a bunch of cartographers that, that listen to this and think, oh, how can I become you know, a professional cartographer? I want to do this. I want to make a living at doing this. Is there anything that's been particularly helpful to you along the way? Like, is there any skill that you've learned? Is there any, I don't know, insights that you could perhaps share with us? Well, I'd say number one is don't be afraid to say that you don't understand something or you don't know how to do something because I feel like that is a great way to learn and everybody around you that has that in them won't see it as anything other than yeah, let me work on that with you or let me tell you more about that. I think community is, is, has really been a big part of my career growth and success. Having great mentors and participating in my community. I know I said, already said community, but I have a great community called NAFIS, North American Cartographic Information Society. And I think that that is really you can learn everything in school. You can 
be on the job and you learn a lot, I encourage internships and if, especially if you're just starting out, getting on research projects in school and having jobs, but it's really when you are with other people that are in your field and that you can share, brainstorm, explore, talk in an environment that is conducive to that kind of thing, that it's really magical and that has been extremely influential for for me too. Yeah, I think a community is is very, very, very underrated. And, and for me, the most underrated thing about it is seeing that recipe. Oh, what is working for other people? And I don't have to go and learn all these hard lessons myself. I can just ask someone. And, and I think you, you mentioned mentoring before. If you can find the right mentor that can say, can point you in the right direction, you can save an incredible amount of time and heartbreak. Definitely. I don't know. Mentorship is super important. And I almost feel like, you know, it's kind of a responsibility for those of us that have been doing something that we've been doing for a while to pass that on to the next generation, especially knowing how impactful it has been, if it has been impactful in your own career growth and life. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Having someone sort of share that recipe, seeing that you're not alone. Like, oh, th this can be a job. This could be a future. This could be my future. Yeah. Um, because it was this other person's future. I, I think that that is incredibly powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mamatha, thank you so much for your time, your enthusiasm. Really, really appreciate it. Um, so we all know by now that you work at Phelps. So I think we can put <laughs> links to that in the show notes. That's not going to be a problem. People are going to understand that bit of it. If if I'm listening to this and I want to reach out to you personally, can I, are you on any social media platforms that I could follow along or that I could reach out to you on? I am on um, Twitter X. I don't know what people are saying these days, but I am on there and at Mamatha Akella. So my first name and my last name together. And I'm also on LinkedIn. So feel free to find me and reach out. Great. I'll, I'll include links to both those places in the show notes. Thank you so much for your time. You were, you were fantastic. Thank you. So I really hope you enjoyed that episode with Mamatha Akella. There'll be links to where you connect with her in the show notes of this episode. Again, I'll also put links to some of those examples that we discussed during the episode. They're well worth checking out. And I'll include a few links to other relevant podcast episodes that you might enjoy as well so please take the time to check those out okay that's it for me that's it for this week's episode of the mapscaping podcast i'll be back again soon i hope that you'll take the time to join me then